What I want to talk about is how we do machine learning now. Well, the thing is, there are these bunch of libraries that you can just load and run, and they just give you anything, basically. All the capabilities of current machine learning, just spin up scikit-learn, open TensorFlow, etc. write 10 lines of code, and you are good to go, right? That's perfect. And if you don't even want to touch any of these libraries explicitly, there are all these APIs, uh, like Google has them, Amazon has them, uh, Microsoft has them, where you just call an API, give it some data, and it gives you machine learning magic. Perfect, so really, no mathematics needed at all. <laughs> uh, this is what you needed to understand if you wanted to do machine learning 10 years ago. Uh, I just opened a random book that was uh, behind me in my office. This is what you need to do if you do want to do machine learning now. Just nothing, basically. Perfect, right? Everything is nice. Uh, I like to use the sort of metaphor of a compiler. And when you are using a compiler, you don't have to understand what's happening underneath. You don't have to understand uh, all the magic. You don't have to understand all those sort of lexing, tokenizing, parsing, the ASTs that are constructed, etc. As a user, you just don't have to care. With machine learning, I think we are not there yet, unfortunately. Uh, with software development compared to machine learning, yeah, you use some kind of algorithms, you implement an algorithm, you give that some inputs, etc. You can have software bugs, but the difference with machine learning is that it can fail silently without anyone realizing. So unless you understand what you are using and what you are using it on, you can get into a very dangerous situation. And I will try to convince you about that today. So what I mean about black box machine learning, which is the title of this talk, well, the rules will be, I'll be using algorithms out of the box with minimal setup. Uh, I won't be looking at the small print at instructions how to use them. Uh, I will keep the mathematics at a minimum and just look where things go wrong. So first thing, linear regression. That's like the hello world of machine learning. Uh, do you think linear regression is AI? Uh, depends on if you want to sell it to someone or not. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do with linear regression, you basically take some inputs and you compute a linear combination of them to get some output. So let's have, uh, I don't want to just talk, I want to show you some practical demos. So that's why I have a Jupyter Notebook here. Uh, because of course I am a cool data scientist. I use Jupyter Notebooks. So, and I really want to convince you that this is all live, so I actually have a presentation here run in the Jupyter Notebook. And this first demo is using R, because in data science you basically use whatever language works for your uh, current problem. So uh, R for me is uh, not, more, not a programming language, it's more a DSL for doing data science or statistics. And linear regression is basically the first thing you learn in R. So let's just load some libraries, mostly for plotting. Done. And first, let's simulate some data. So what I'm doing here, I'm simulating random noise. This is the R command for generating a normal distribution with uh, 100 points from a normal distribution with uh, zero mean and unit variance. And both X and Y are just random noise. So let's try running linear regression on that. So right now, this is the equation for linear regression. This is as much mathematics as you'll get here. Uh, and both x and y are random noise. And I'm trying to estimate a and b. In R, you run the lm command, meaning linear model. And this is the summary you get in R. This is not very user friendly. You have to understand quite a lot of statistics to actually read this, but the two key things to look at here are first, this multiple R squared, which tells you 
how much variance in the data you can predict with this model. So if it's zero, that means your model is rubbish, data is noise, your model doesn't predict anything. If it's 100, then your model predicts the data perfectly. So you can see that here it's basically zero. This makes sense, my data is a noise. The second thing to look at is the p-value, which was always something that always gets reported in journals, etc. Uh, and that basically tells you the probability that I'm getting these results by chance. In this case, it's 73%. Again, makes sense. I can't publish it. This is just noise. But what if I add one single data point that's something called an outlier? So what I did here, this is my original data, all the noise, and I added one single data point here. It's just one data point that's somewhere completely outside of my data. Well, I see some people giggling because they know what will happen. <laughs> so let's try another linear regression. And now my multiple R squared is 98%. Suddenly this model almost perfectly predicts my data. Everything is fine, right? And if I look at my p-value, it's basically zero. That means the probability I'm getting these results by chance is zero. That's amazing. I'm getting basically a perfect model just by adding one single data point to a noise. So if I didn't look at my actual data, I would trust this model. This looks perfect, right? And linear regression is uh, the cornerstone of a lot of methods that are used in practice. And if you don't look at the data, you get something like this. So this is my first scary example. And the thing is, if you understand linear regression, if you are a statistician, you say, well, of course, like, it's a very well understood model. You look at Wikipedia, and it has this are just the basically part of the article that talks about assumptions that you should verify before using linear regression. And it uses terms like weak exogeneity, homoscedasticity, you expect lack of perfect multicollinearity between predictors. And as a normal person, you look at it and think, like, what is this? <laughs> And I really think that in machine learning and statistics, it's really a human-computer interaction problem because you can't expect everyone to basically read all the small print and understand it if it uses all these terms. Uh, so I think that if, if anyone writes some libraries that are used by other people, you probably don't expect them to know when specifically to use your function. And machine learning is not there yet. Like basically, no one tells you, uh, your data is not the right data to use this method on. Uh, you can run linear reg regression on any kind of data set and it won't ever alert you unless you dig deep and know the statistics behind it. So that was basically the simplest algorithm you can have uh, in machine learning. So let's look at another favorite called decision trees. Uh, who heard about decision trees? Most people, nice. So let's look at another Jupyter Notebook. So let's start with the basic data set in any kind of uh, machine learning or decision tree specifically tutorial. Who survives the Titanic? which is basically just taking the data set of all the passengers on Titanic, uh, including their sex, uh, their cabin numbers, uh, how much they paid for a ticket, if they traveled as a family, etc., and trying to predict who survives and who dies on Titanic. So here I'm using Python, because why not again? And this is just the beginning of the training data set where I'm having passenger ID, they survived or not, what class they were traveling, what was their name, etc. And I will try to, uh, well, first some pre-processing. I'm just basically changing the uh, sex variable from male and female to zero and one, because it's always nicer to work with numerical uh, values. 
So instead of having a nice data frame, I now have a matrix. And I hate this keyboard, sorry. <laughs> And I will just train a decision tree classifier from scikit-learn. It's literally a one-liner. How does it look? This is how the result actually looks when I visualize the decision tree. So this is how you interpret a decision tree. You look at each node, and it tells you, based on some variable, in this case it's the numerical sex value, uh, and based on some threshold value, you either go left or right. So in this case, it's asking if the numerical sex is smaller than 0 0.5, uh, meaning 0 was a male, 1 is a female. So if it's smaller than 0 0.5, that means it's a male, you go left. If it's a female, you go right. And you continue until you get to a bottom node, which is the class. So in this case, for example, if you are a male, you go left. And in this very simplistic model, the only way to survive on Titanic was to get to this node, which says you are a male, you are younger than seven, and you are traveling with less than three siblings. So that's the way to survive if you are a male on Titanic. <laughs> so. It's fairly nice, you can see what's happening there, you can interpret the results, you can actually sort of go through the decisions, uh, analyze them, etc. Everything nice, right? Everyone loves decision trees. And this is the sort of algorithm that wins uh, in Kaggle competitions as a part of random forests and boosted decision trees, etc. It's a very popular one. So let's look at some case where they don't work that well. I will again simulate some data set. And it will be probably easier if I plot it first. So this is my data set where this is my X value. Uh, this is my Y value. And the green is class zero and the red or the orange one is class one. So it works, uh, x and y are between 0 and 100. And if x plus y is smaller than 100, then it's 0. If it's larger than 100, it's 1. Well, that's OK. This is how I generated it. Uh, I basically just made uh, the, sort of the output. Uh, if literally x plus y is smaller than 100, then it's zero, otherwise it's one. So it's a one liner to generate this data set. So what can we do with it? Well, let's run a decision tree on this. Mm -hmm. right. And this is how it looks. <laughs> this is a decision tree run on two variables. And if you zoom on this, it's basically just asking, OK, if is x smaller than this value, is y smaller than that value, et cetera. Like you end up with a completely crazy model just because you can't slice your data set uh, diagonally. So uh, because your values that you are putting into the decision tree are related, that the output relates on combination of two values, you end up with a completely crazy model that doesn't make any sense. I literally generated this as a one-liner, and you end up with something like this. So to think with decision trees, uh, let's close this again. You end up with this in practice as well. I was talking to a colleague and she was telling me that how she did this Kaggle competition just for fun. And she wanted to demonstrate how, uh, how decision trees are so sort of, uh, uh, explainable and nice, etc. And she did a proper analysis with a lot of stuff, etc. And she ended up with a model like this. 
Again, it's a completely crazy model. This is for uh, something with about 20 variables. And this is not interpretable. I mean, you look at it, it doesn't make any sense to anyone. So, again, what does uh, Wikipedia have to say about decision trees? Well, the advantages and disadvantages, they are simple to understand and interpret. No, only if your data set is the right data set for a decision tree. If it's not the right data set, then they are not easy to interpret at all. So, sorry, that's just me screaming about people saying that decision trees are the most interpretable model. Only if your data set is the right data set for the model. Let's do something fun. Let's go into deep learning. That's everywhere now, right? So let's have a look at a demo of deep learning here. Again, for this one, I'm using F sharp because why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. This is just loading the libraries. And this relies on internet here, so let's hope this works. Uh, I, I'll be calling the Azure Cognitive Services for image recognition. And the way they work, you give them a picture and they give you a description and tags that belong to that picture. I'm using type providers in F-sharp because I'm just too lazy to look at JSON files, etc. This is a fairly ugly function to actually construct the request to the API and parse the result and print it. So let's test it. And this is all markdown, so I'm not trying to sort of sneak anything uh, uh, unsavory here. I'm using the same image uh, in the markdown and in the function that I'm calling. So this is a guitar. So let's see what the cognitive services have to say about this. OK. It, can you see the result? I'll make it a bit larger. So it's a close-up of a guitar. And the tags that it decided to add were music, guitar, musical instrument, etc. Hmm, fine. What about this one? This one is a monkey sitting on a table. Well, maybe not table so much, uh, but still, it's fairly okay. It's a primate, animal, mammal, sitting, old world monkey, new world monkey, so a bit not sure there, but still, it's reasonable. Let's try another monkey just to make sure. Okay, and this one is a monkey sitting on a branch. Yes, it got that right. And again, it's on a tree, it's outdoor, etc. Fine, right? Let, this works. Let's put it into production uh, and everything. Well, let's try something sort of the obvious things to try when you are testing something like this is to use something that the system definitely hasn't seen. So let's try a slightly naive <laughs> example. <laughs> so the one thing to notice is everyone is laughing because this image is very disturbing. <laughs> Will the neural network tell us this is disturbing? No. <laughs> so let's see what it thinks. I call it a smeal, a smiling seal, but it, it, <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> Okay, it tells me it's a close-up of a fish. I would say it's doing pretty well for something that's definitely not normal. <laughs> One thing to notice is that it doesn't see the teeth. <laughs> but I think it's like, you look at this and it's, this is disturbing, but I think it's still doing pretty well. So let's try to modify, let's try something different. <laughs> Let's give the monkey a guitar. And surprisingly, it's a monkey holding a guitar. <laughs> All right. So let's give the guitar to the other monkey then. And this is a dog looking at the camera. So what is happening there? Why is it suddenly turning into a dog? Well, my theory is that it's inside and the network probably has seen quite a lot of dogs uh, playing around things that you find in home, like guitars, etc. And it's furry, so it must be a dog. <laughs> it's trying to interpret it uh, in a way. 
well, let's try to do something even weirder. Let's just hover the guitar in the air. <laughs> and suddenly it's a monkey holding a dog. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening here. <laughs> but this is still using the live cognitive services. I've been relying on them getting this wrong for this talk, and they're still getting it wrong. I'm really not sure what's happening there. So what does the neural network actually see? Well, another nice example, this is called, from the blog uh, AI Weirdness by General Shane. Uh, like a nice landscape. Let's, let's find out what it actually is. And it's a herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside. Can you see any sheep in there? There are none. <laughs> but it's the sort of landscape where you might get sheep. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like the sort of landscape where you get sheep. And the problem with these neural networks is that they don't look at specific objects. They just don't understand the picture. They are looking more at textures and shapes of things rather than actual objects. Uh, this is a picture from our office in the Turing. Uh, let's try another one. This is a man standing in a room, it's indoor, there's whiteboard, etc. It's in an office, fine. Let's try to put the elephant in the room. <laughs> and it's a couple of people that are standing in a room. No elephants anywhere. Because the neural network just ignores things that are not normal in that kind of setting. Like you might be thinking, okay, there are no elephants uh, in your office, so it's probably fine. But this can happen in areas where you don't expect it, because this neural network just doesn't see things uh, that it doesn't expect in that kind of setting. And I'm not picking up on Microsoft here. If you run it on a Google services, if you run it on Amazon, if you downloaded a trained neural network and run it yourself, you would get the same result. Maybe not specifically the same words, etc. Maybe it would have slightly different tweaks. I think the Azure Cognitive Services were at some point quite biased towards giraffes. <laughs> uh, but different networks have different tweaks, but really this is a general thing that happens. This is a feature of the technology that we are using for this now. Uh, let's try to put uh, the elephant next to the monkey. Maybe it's in a sort of forest setting. Uh, this is not so unexpected. Maybe you don't expect uh, the elephant to just hover in midair, but still. And what I'm getting is monkey sitting on a branch, zero elephants again. Yes? Can you train it to understand these kinds of situations? Can you train it to understand these kinds of situations? Yes, if you train specifically for that. They are not trained for that. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems that these networks just don't see things that are not expected in that kind of context. Uh, let's try something completely surreal. Uh, this is from René Magritte, the Son of Man painting. Well, if you look at it as a normal person, the first thing you notice is an apple. And what do we get from the neural network? It's a man wearing a suit and a hat. No apples. It just doesn't see that at all. And one last example of this sort. Uh, maybe if you see this painting, this is not a pipe. Maybe you wondered what, it is, what is it actually? Well, let's ask. If it's not a pipe, what is it? And it's a close-up of a mug. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. <laughs> So, and this is all fun, right? Well, you see, the problem is that the network just doesn't see things it doesn't want to see. Uh, you see all of these articles where they say, oh, scientists designed this algorithm to escape the surveillance, etc." These things are actually quite hard to do because you generally need access to the network uh, that's behind it and you need to query it and see what it gives you as a result, etc. So it's fairly hard to get to something like this. But 
it's fairly easy to confuse an actual neural network. <laughs> this is an example from Reddit uh, where uh, if you have some phone app uh, and you take a couple of pictures uh, in the same setting, it offers to create a panorama for you automatically. Well, this user decided, yes, I want a panorama and ended up as a mountain peak in there. <laughs> <laughs> because the network just really doesn't understand the concepts of objects. They work just by looking at textures, shapes, etc. And this is fine because, well, it really depends on what you train them on. This is a research published by Facebook researchers earlier this year where they looked at something similar that I did here. They used uh, all of the standard providers of machine learning APIs for image recognition. And they were looking at images from countries like the UK, high income countries, compared to images from low income countries. And uh, this is a soap, and it gets recognized as a soap, as a sink, etc. This is a soap from Nepal. None of the services recognized that as a soap. All of them said it's food. So you can see suddenly it becomes a diversity issue because what you train the network on, that's what it will recognize. And suddenly it will recognize only things that are in Europe and US, etc. But it doesn't recognize things in low income countries. And another example from uh, this Wednesday, actually. Uh, they published a report on uh, the pedestrian that got killed by uh, Uber's self-driving car last year. And they realized that the system wasn't trained to look for jaywalkers, for people who are crossing the road and are not on a proper crossing. And that's a huge problem. I mean, the system just didn't know how to classify a person crossing the road. Uh, it basically detected something happening about six seconds before the crash happened, and it was switching the classification between a bicycle, vehicle, uh, object that's stationary, etc. It just couldn't recognize it as a person because it wasn't trained to recognize people outside of crossings. So, and this is happening in medicine as well. That's the really scary thing for me. Uh, this is paper published last year where they looked at uh, image recognition system designed to classify pneumonia in patients from x-rays. And they tried the system trained in one hospital to transfer it to another hospital. And they looked at, well, the performance was terrible in the other hospital. So they looked at what is the neural network actually looking at when it's trying to classify patients. And it was looking at a shoulder. Why classifying pneumonia? And the reason was that for some of these patients, they were too, too sick to go to an actual x-ray, and they got a mobile x-ray wheeled to their uh, hospital bed, and they got x-rayed there. And for that, the technicians put a metal tag on their shoulder to calibrate the machine. And you can see that if you are too sick to go to an actual x-ray, there is much higher probability that you probably do have pneumonia. So the network learned to actually just look at the shoulder for the metal tag. And another example is classifying uh, melanoma in patients. Uh, this is research published about three months ago where they looked at algorithm that is right now uh, approved to be used for diagnosis in Europe, in European Union. And what the researchers did, they basically, what the algorithm does, it looks at skin marks and classifies them as benign or malignant. So the researchers took the skin marks and created artificial surgical marks around them, which surgeons do typically before extracting the mark. Or another thing they did, they basically took a mark and zoomed in on it, made it larger. Well, of course, when they make surgical marks around them, suddenly they were classified as malignant 100% of the time. Because in the training data set, uh, if surgeon made marks around it to mark it for extraction, then it was probably malignant. 
And the network learns all these things that you don't want it to learn. And if you don't analyze it properly, if you don't look at your data and look at all the biases in your data, you end up with these sort of weird uh, artifacts that you are not actually trying to optimize for. Uh, so my the title of this talk was about black box machine learning, but it's about black box data. Because if you don't know about your data, and if you don't understand what are the biases in your data, you can, things can go wrong very, very quickly. Uh, and I tried to show you that in uh, all these uh, cases with the decision tree, with the linear regression, with deep learning, it was always the case of the data not being the right fit for the model, how the model works or how the model was trained. And this is a big problem because how do we get the sort of data that we would be able to use for anything. So machine learning magic is that there is basically no magic. It works in exactly the same way as software. The sort of input you give it, the sort of output you get. And if your input is flawed, your output will be flawed as well. Uh, my favorite example is uh, this, the Norman, world's first psychopath AI, which is uh, sort of funny research done by the MIT Media Lab, where they were trying to uh, demonstrate exactly that, that the sort of training data you use for a machine learning system uh, determines how it will behave. So how did they create the psychopath AI? They crawled the deepest, darkest corners of Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> they trained it on that, and they put it into an image recognition system. And then they gave it Rorschach test. <laughs> so this is standard AI, black and white photo of a small bird. This is Norman. Man gets pulled into a dough machine. <laughs> uh, man is shot dead in front of his screaming wife. <laughs> so, and this is just about giving it the wrong type of data. But how do we know that if we are giving our systems that we are putting into production the right kind of data? And that's the real problem. The, the technology, all the machine learning algorithms, we are talking about algorithmic bias and things like that. It's not about the algorithms. It's about the data that are trained, that are used for training that system. And because we are taking data from our current practices, they are necessarily biased towards what we are doing now. Uh, so whenever you use some kind of machine learning system that you didn't build yourself, ask a lot of questions about the data that were used to train that system. Like where do they come from? What are the biases in the data? And if they tell you there are no biases in the data, they just haven't discovered them yet uh, because there are always some biases in the data. And again, is the model the right one for the data as well? And the last one is very important. Is your model actually doing what you think it's doing? Because things can go very wrong very, very quickly. Uh, and you may not realize that because the numerical precisions, et cetera, might be looking completely fine. So unfortunately, oh, I like to use the metaphor of uh, an iceberg for the work of a data scientist, where the top of the iceberg are all these like, cool algorithms and doing the machine learning. and. Uh, doing the deep learning, et cetera. But the bottom is all the data pre-processing that goes into that. Uh, because data science is 80% data wrangling and 20% complaining about data wrangling. <laughs> uh, so it's the non-glamorous part which is actually more important than the actual algorithms. Because right now to run any of the algorithms, it's literally just one liner in the library of your choice. And I'm not actually worried about uh, general AI taking over. I'm more worried about people using current algorithms in the wrong way without actually thinking about it and without thinking about the data that were used to produce that kind of algorithm. So that's all for me for today. So if you are tempted to use black box AI, think about black box data. Thank you. <laughs>